little over a decade ago, I was living downtown between Skid Row and the LA River. Um, so, vortex of mandatory depression. And I was uh, committed to indulging my body in every single destructive affinity I could. And uh, <clears throat> I came across John O'Brien's work at that time, as well as Jerry Stahl's Permanent Midnight. And both books had a profound effect on me as a person and as a aspiring writer. And it's an honor for me to be here today. Um, it's sort of a testament to my um, progress and my liver, too. Um, <laughs> I should dedicate every book I write from here on out to my liver, probably. Maybe one to my kidneys, one to my heart, but my liver. Um, and it's easy, it's easy to find the affinity in those books because of the life I was living. And I want to make it clear that it's not just the subject matter, but the actual artistic integrity of the literature, the, the way it's written. It's not just, um, oh, this guy's writing about my life or kind of thing, but the brutal language of O'Brien's work. I feel that, although it was um, very co-committant to the lifestyle I was living, it, the, the language transcended um, the subject matter and was true art. And I'm honored to uh, read a passage from his, his uh, last, this is the end of it, right? The last posthumously published work, which is one of my favorite books of his. Um, I know that in the media, he got pigeonholed for his alcoholism. And I, I find that a, a little, um, a, a little sad because the fact that this man died and had three novel, three good, really good novels waiting to be published is proof that he was doing more than just drinking. And everyone wants to say he was just drinking. And of, of all of my um, chemical <laughs> indulgences, alcohol is probably my main most man. And uh, to see that there's something that was attributed to more than just like this. Oh, he was the alcoholic writer. Like if you look up his books in the library, it says alcoholism or whatever. And um, there's there's much more to it than than any of that. Um, I, I recently read that he was a huge Bob Dylan fan, right? He he uh, he had his middle name was Dylan on his high school diploma. Is that right? Yes. Yes, okay. He, which wasn't his real middle name. His given name. And I remember um, when, I, when, I, when I was living downtown and first discovered his work, I, uh, I had a line on some liquid codeine, quarts of liquid codeine. And I would make gin and codeine and just put on Dylan's Desolation Row like over and over again and watch the pathetic trickle of the L.A. River go by. Sounds romantic, but it sucked at the time. <laughs> it was the loneliest hell I ever fucking delved in. <laughs> and the sad thing is if a bottle of liquid coating walked along right now, I'd pound it. Um, but the man, the man added to my dregs. So I'm going to read a little passage from his new novel, Better. And I'll be followed by the amazing Jerry Stahl and John's sister, Erin O'Brien. Uh, the book is about this uh, house in Malibu, a debaucherous little haven for drinking and having sex. Um, almost inconsequentially, it, it seems, until the consequences arise. And... Each person in the house is sort of tied to another person, and the narrator, William, is tied to this 
prostitute who gives up prostitution to live in this house named Zipper. Which, would you say Zipper is the, the best name for a prostitute you ever heard in your life? Yeah. Um, appropriate. So I'm going to read this uh, portion where he's describing his um, affinity to Zipper and what that means. Zipper is my pimp. I'm a philosophical bone digger in love with the dormant verb of my life. I am the passive voice. I vigorously assert it to myself on a constant basis. I mope around, sleep outside, get drunk, and wear my little shield of independence and isolation, proud and protected. But with her, between her and me, I give it up on demand, or I used to. Still do, I guess. What this has to do with our relationship, I don't know. If she says it, I do it, and not because I want to. No, I smile for Zipper because it's what I have to do to survive. No room in this bed for integrity of purpose. This bed is only big enough for my stupid grin and Zipper's sublime breasts, hair, pussy, lighthearted wariness. She is sure as hell better than them. So elemental they are, so detailed they are, with their small world reasoning, their well-timed tics, and their choppy little once-learned tricks, still better than our best practice studies, the weight of polycotton blend. A lone stream of sweat bisecting a buttock, a subtle imperfection, perhaps a line around the mouth, or a misplaced pound, a stray glance or a stray pubic hair, an unobserved observation of a once-over in a convenient mirror, a tan line, the absence of one, an implication. At their best, that's what they are, an implication. Obsession used to be my M.O., then depression. Now I've given up. A sign of maturity, a taste of success. Zipper is my simple talk, my savvy chick. Making love to her once, I heard her utter a foreign exclamation. I don't even think she was aware of it. In any case, she claims not to remember. And considering her passion, I believe her. She also claims her great-grandmother was a black slave in, in Brazil. But this is only one of many such tales I've heard from her. Some conflicting. She does have that subtle, libidinal superiority that I've felt in black girls. Guiltily, I've even considered her grandmother as a young girl. Coily concupiscent in her inadequate rag dress, eyes boldly darting from their downward cast, she whimpers as I take her on the straw mattress of her shack, where she silently plots my murder. <laughs> <laughs>